Hello, everyone. So we're going to get started. Um, so today I'm talking about multilingual um, and the lessons that we learned from building a rather large multilingual and multi-region website in Drupal 8 um, earlier this year. So a bit about me first. Uh, my name is Stella. I've been involved in the Drupal community for, I don't know, longer than I care to remember, uh, 4.7 days. I was originally a hobbyist, so I did this as a hobby in my spare time, and then I went to Drupaton Zaged and realized other people were making careers out of it, so I started my own company, at which point I stopped contributing, really, and started working. Um, so I'm mainly a, originally a back-end developer, but these days I'm mainly managing a company, but ever so often I get to work in a project, which is what happened earlier this year. So just a bit of a background about the project. Um, I won't be really touching on it again, but it was for an Irish multinational. They were launching a new brand across the globe, not just in Ireland. And they wanted four different regions and 13 languages, distinct languages. Um, so they, the content in North America was different for, than the content in Europe, even though they were both speaking English. So that's what I mean by multi-region. So just to briefly summarize what we're going to go through today, time allowing. Uh, first, how to configure your languages and what language negotiation means. Translation versus localization, and there is an important difference, especially if you're using the paragraphs module. That's not me. <laughs> okay. Um, so just some of the the pains uh, that we encountered there, how to translate stuff, uh, yeah, the joys and pains of translating paragraphs and uh, menus. And if I have time, I'll go more into the, the multi-region stuff at the end. So first of all, getting set up. Um, who here has used Drupal 7 multilingual? Raise your hands. Okay, good. Because this is in the beginner session. <laughs> so Drupal 8 is coming out and there are four modules in you need, or you don't have to use them all, but four of them in Drupal core. You do not need the internationalization mo module. You do not need I18N. So this is fantastic. There's four main modules. Um, I'm going to start at the bottom. Language essentially just allows you to add another language to your site. So if you're just going to do a, a single language site, say in French, then you can just add that. It will download the, the French language pack and you don't need the other ones. Interface translation then allows you to translate the system strings. So say like there's text that's defined by the module that you're not able to configure, like say uh, the search button text, it allows you to translate that. Then there's content translation, which allows you to translate, translate your entities, um, your nodes and taxonomy terms, and then configuration translation, which I guess is the equivalent of I18N variable in uh, Drupal 7, so it allows you to translate configuration strings that you might enter when configuring a module. So first of all, you need to add your languages. So this is the, it hasn't changed much from, from Drupal 7 really, it looks slightly different, but you can add new languages. Now this drop down in the screenshot is just set to custom language, but you know, French, German, Spanish, all of those there, and you can pick those the one you want, and when you do, it will download the language pack from localize.drupal.org. However, in our case, we were doing multi-region, so we had to define different language codes, like ENGB for English in the UK, and EN, well, we just went with EN for the US. Um, so, I don't know, we did Spanish in Latin America, Spanish in, in Europe, there were different language codes that we used. So that allows you to do that. And then you, if you want, you can download the regular Spanish pack uh, and then import those strings into your custom variable just to give you a head start. So these are some of the languages that we had. So English, North America, Asia Pacific, EMEA, Latin America, it went on. Couldn't fit them all on the screen. We also had Russian and Chinese. Um, I got pretty good at not necessarily reading Russian, but at least being able to figure out the character combinations that made me do what I want. So, 
Language negotiation, if you've, a lot of fair of you have used Drupal 7 before, so I'm not going to spend much time on it, but it's basically when you, a user comes to the website at the naked domain, so how do they know, how does the browser know, how does the website know which language to return? So the first thing that we've done is to set it to the URL. So if you've come and you're requesting um, example.com slash en, then you're going to get the English version. If you go to example.com slash f4, you're going to get the French version. So we'll check that first. If that's not set, then we have configured it to be, in this case, the IP address. It'd be probably more standard in most sites to use the browser. So if the user has um, configured their preferred language in their browser, then it would use that. Um, but as we were doing IP address, I'd said in, English in North America is different than English in Europe, then we couldn't just rely on the browser settings so they would just get English, and we needed to know which English. So um, the IP address one um, is by the IP language negotiation module. So that was an add-on that we used, and it's one that we ported to Drupal 8. So, I just want to briefly talk about the difference between translation and localization, and it will become important later because it really, you know, caused me a lot of pain. <laughs> um, and I don't want you to fall into the, the same mistakes. So translation in my head is you have a copy of your content in English and you want the exact same thing, just translated like for like, word for word into French. If you have a view and you're returning all, you know, say, latest news articles in the, the current language, then it will return them all in French, say. Um, but if it finds a node that has not been translated into French, then the normal process is that it will just return the English version because that's the one it has. That's the master copy or the source, say. That's pretty much OK. By and large, as long as you're not using paragraphs. So I'll come back to that. Localization is when you have content in the same language, but it's targeted to different locations. So you're localizing it to the region. So you're localizing English to North America or English to, to Europe. The content often diverges. So in our case, the solutions or services offered by the client were different. They offered different solutions in Europe than they did in North America. As a result, their menus also changed. And I'll come a bit more into menu translation later on, but that it's an important difference that the menus actually changed the links that they had. So adding translations. I'll start first with the, the system strings. It hasn't really changed since Drupal 7. You, you, know, you enter in the part of the string that you want to translate, you find it in your language that's missing, and you translate. The one thing to watch out for here is that it's taste sensitive. So um, we, our clients were translating, and they didn't, didn't always notice that they had to enter it in perfectly in their same capitalization. And spacing. So trailing spaces and stuff like that can really mess things up. So for who here has used entity translation in Drupal 7? OK, about half the room. So Drupal Core in, in Drupal 7 had the concept of, I think it was called content translation or no translation, which was essentially when you translated your node from English into German, then it would create a brand new node, give it a new node ID, and then it linked the two in the database through a translated node ID or a TNID. So that's done. Instead, we have what essentially was entity translation module uh, in Drupal 7. That's now in core. So here you have the one node container, and the fields are translated. And you can choose which fields are allowed to be translated. So it's much better. It's much easier to translate, especially if you're using field collections or paragraphs. Um, and it's just nicer. In this case, uh, we had a node called bakery. And this is the translate tab that you would normally expect. And you can go down and add or edit the translation for your language. Enabling translation for your entity. So you can either go through 
you know, the, what is it, structure content types into your content type, click enable translation for this node, and then go into and edit each field. That's a not very, you know, good use of your time. Um, so there is a, another page underneath the regional and language configuration section, which allows you to, just with checkboxes, enable which content types, or which entities, first of all, have translation enabled, and then which content types within, say, the content section, and then once you tick the content type, it then shows you the fields, and you can just go tick, tick, tick. So this is the top part of the screen, where you can choose your entities. Then you get to your nodes. So you can, just, we had a call to action node, we had a campaign node, we had other ones. And as soon as you click translate in the campaign, then it shows the fields, and you can click translate on those. And it's not just nodes, it's also taxonomy terms and any other entity, so from products to menus and so on. So I'm just going to quickly, okay, that did not keep my browser over there. I better not put up the trivia questions. And my browser with my handyly pre-prepared tabs has disappeared. So. Hmm? I'm just going there again. Uh, this is a old test site, so you can ignore the security warning. Uh, so configuration. Regional language. So, content language translation. Let's see if I can make that better. Can you read it at the back? So, I'm just going to assume that you will. It, it doesn't really, it's not relevant for this point. The point is, you choose your entities at the top, and then you enable it. If you have a lot of content types and you're translating them all and they all have lots of fields and then you've got paragraphs and you're translating them and taxonomy terms and menus and blocks, you get a page that looks like this. <laughs> so, it's not the best user experience. It's quicker than going in and editing each field individually. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> So menus, um, there's a few sort of minor gotchas. It, it, it's straightforward enough, but um, it really, it, it tripped up our clients on, on numerous occasions. But first of all, on that same big long screen, you can choose to translate your custom menu links. So you choose that and then you can translate the title and the description and when it was last changed, if you so wish, that's fine. Um, when you go into your menu configuration, you get a screen like this. So you can see your menu items, and then you've got this translate menu at the top, which it kind of has the design, same design pattern as when you go to translate a node. It has the translate tab bes beside it at the top. However, if you go and click on that translate menu, what you're actually doing is translating main navigation and site section links. You're not translating the links within the menu. You actually have to go and click on the drop down button besides each link and click translate on those. Um, the other thing to watch out for, which I alluded to earlier, is straight, you can translate menus links, but there are some things that are the same across all languages. So you'll see, and it does include it, you know, handily, all languages in brackets after it. I just didn't notice it at the time. Um, that you know, enabled all languages and shows expanded all languages and the link all languages. So if you change that, it affects all your translations across the entire site. And what happened with us was they had different solutions. They had solutions or services in their menu and we, they had different solutions in different regions. What we ended up having to do was cloning the entire menu and translating it again, just so we could change the link and remove one solution from the menu. And there isn't a workaround for that. You just have to do it. So 
just watch out for that. So who here has used paragraphs? Oh, goody. Who here has used paragraphs in Drupal 8? Yay. I love paragraphs. Um, paragraphs is where translation gets messy. Um, so it's worth taking it back a bit. Um, OK, so when I'm, I've, with entity translation, when you translate something from English to Irish or French or whatever, you have the same node ID, and you just have the just sort of different aspects, I think. I like to think of it as different views in on the node, and just the fields are translated. And that's fine, and that, that's just not just for nodes, for entities. So paragraphs are entities in their own right. So the recommendation for paragraphs out of the box is that you don't translate the paragraph field, but you translate the paragraph entity. Yeah, yeah, let me sure I got that right. So what you, ends up happening is you have one paragraph with the one paragraph ID with different aspects, just different the fields on it translated, which is fine until you actually want to change the paragraphs that you have. And by change the paragraphs, I mean you want to remove one, or you want to add one, or you just want a different image or something on it. If you need to reorder them in one language over another language, then this isn't working, because the reordering affects all your language versions. And if you remove one, it removes it from all the languages, not just the one that you're currently translating. Similarly, if you want to add one to the German version of your site, you can't because it's going, uh-uh, you're not allowed to do that. So there is, you need to do localization. You need to translate the paragraph field, not the paragraph entity. However, to do that, you need a patch. Um, and it's not fully stable. Well, actually, the patch works pretty well, and we've been using it for six months. It just doesn't have tests and other, maybe some edge cases aren't out. So I will say use at your own risk, but it has been in production for us for six months, and it's been working perfectly. However, I mentioned that it's important to get translation versus localization right at the beginning of your project, because we didn't. and. What happened was we went, OK, right, we need to translate the field, not the paragraph entity. Let's go change our configuration and that long list of things. And once we did that, all our translations went poof and disappeared. And they all reverted to English. And we, had, we were still not in production, which was fine. We were close to production, which was not so fine. And uh, it had two months of content added by the users. So uh, the translations were still there. They were in the database. They just weren't able to be accessed. So we had to do a little bit of hacking and database hacking and fix it. So I really just do it right the first time. Is it, it's a worthwhile conversation to have with your client. And we've just, we have actually had this conversation with clients, like in Ireland, public sector bodies, you have to produce your websites in English and Irish, or at least as much Irish as you can get away with, or as little. Um, uh, so, but they're very, very much in the like for like translation. We were just translating the content. We're not changing the menus. We don't have different things in different languages. But what did happen to us, well, is that is fine. The majority of cases, they're a bit slow at doing their Irish translations. Uh, so when they have a paragraphs and stuff in the home page, they want to be able to have different content pulled in as their highlighted, you know, press release or whatever. Um, and you can't do that if you're doing translation. It will default back to the English. And so they actually want the content to diverge simply because they don't have the translation ready yet and they don't want to display English on the Irish version because that's just a whole political mess. So just get it right. <laughs> um, translating configuration then. Um, so modules, like the Easy Breadcrumb module, uh, come with strings that you can after configure, or, ah, sorry, often configure through the user interface. So this was a, a very simple example, but with the Easy Breadcrumb module, you can configure the text for the home link, and you can say you, you know, that you want it to be home or you want it to be something else. I don't know why you wouldn't choose home, but anyway. You, 
you then need to translate that, though. Um, so this module, at the start of the project, we patched it and, and contributed it back. Uh, it didn't support uh, translation. Well, I'll come back to that in one second. The, the next slide is when you do click translate. So translate easy breadcrumb tab at the top. When you do click it, you get a page like you would with any other uh, translation thing with the various fields that you can, just the ones that can be translated. So it didn't work. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't possible to translate it. So for the module developers or patchers in the room, there's three schema files or three YAML files that you need. Uh, the first is the schema, which defines, you should have it anyway. Uh, it defines what variables or, or configuration settings you can capture in your module. Only two of them types are, are translatable, text and label. If you use the string uh, type or, or you know field type, like there's Boolean and string and reference and text and, and so on. If you use the string, it's not translatable. I'm not quite sure the reasoning behind that, but you want to use text or label depending on this, whether it's a text field or a text area. You also, so I did that, and then I also added in my uh, config translation YAML file, which essentially just says, hey, this module has translation or configuration that can be translated. I didn't really know what that did, and I'll, I'll come back to it uh, later, because it, it would have saved me a bit of time when it's, I, it would have saved me time figuring out why the other third part doesn't work, which is where I needed the third YAML file, which is the, the links task. So I had the schema configured, and I had the module saying, hey, I've configuration that can be translated. What I didn't have was a menu task item for the Easy Breadcrumb module. I could access Easy Breadcrumb configuration page, it was in the menu, but it didn't have a local task. So that meant it couldn't have a tab. And if it couldn't have a tab, then the config translation couldn't attach itself to its parent and give a, a translate tab beside it. But, um, If I had known what the configuration translation YAML file did, um, I would have spotted that the page was actually there. It was just the tabs were missing. And what it actually does is underneath, um, so administration, configuration, regional language, there is a configuration translation uh, link where you can, like the content one that we saw earlier that was really long, um, there's another tab or menu item there where you can go in and see what modules have declared that they have trans or configuration to translate and you can just go in there and it's sort of a handy gateway to translating different modules. Um, any case. So, translating views. This is the top of a news view. So it's possible to translate views or translate views in Drupal 8 out of the box, which is woohoo. Uh, the user interface isn't so great. So maybe I'll just show you what it is like in reality. And this is where I get a crick in my neck, try to look up. So where's the news? News, news, news and resources. So you can just go here and translate, or you can go in and edit and then hit the translate tab. And then you pick your language. So this is the views configuration. Uh, we have, I can't really see it. Uh, but you've got the different displays, I'm guessing, over here. You're right, it really is difficult to see the screen from here. <laughs> um, so you have your, master dis have your master display settings, and there's a lot of clicking in. So if you have exposed filters, you eventually get in here, and you can change the search button or apply button. Um, uh, you eventually can click in, and you can change the options for page text in the pager, filters, oh, yeah. There's a lot of clicking or nested stuff 
that goes on. If you want to change the text that appears in the menu, then you have to find a page display. I can't see whether these are page displays or not. This one is. Yeah. And then click. And somewhere in here, honest. Uh, there's a lot of clicking. Anyway, somewhere in there, you can translate the menu item and so on. And it's just, it, it's great that you can do that, but there is a lot of nested clicking in to it. The other thing to watch out for is if you've got views exposed filters and say you have a views exposed filter on the taxonomy tags directory or, or taxonomy term, you actually have to go to structure taxonomy types, find the tags and translate them there, not in the view. Which makes sense when you think about it, but um, it can be a bit confusing. I'm actually doing pretty okay for time. Okay, uh, so localization. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, this particular site, they wanted different, the same language in multiple regions. So they wanted it in English, as I say, English North America, different from English EMEA, different from English Asia Pacific, and, and so on. So just, a, this doesn't come out of the box, so there was a little bit of just custom configuration and a, a tiny bit of a glue module just to, to put it together. So how we approached it was, as you saw earlier, we added multiple languages in the EN, US, EN, GB, or, and so on to get all our different languages. Then we had a taxonomy region, or for the region. So we had four taxonomy terms being EMEA, Latin America, North America, and Asia Pacific. For each one, we configured the allowed languages or the enabled languages for that region and the countries in each region. We used the IP language notation, whatever, module to, uh, we ported that to Drupal 8, and so that would detect your IP address with the IP to country module, actually. Um, that would map, so the IP to country matches your IP address against the country database, and then the IP language negotiation module determines which country that is and then returns the correct language. And then we also had to have menus, different menus per region, and then we also had, yeah, we had a, a small little module that added a block to make the taxonomy region term into a drop down that when you changed it would automatically submit and change the user's language. So this is the taxonomy term. This, okay, I have no mess. So the first language drop down is actually the language of the vocabulary. So you can translate uh, Europe or North America into whatever language if you so wished. And then, uh, the second language dropdown is actually the default language for the region. So if it can't figure it out, but it knows you're coming from Europe, then you're going to get this language. Then we use, there's a language field module, which gave us, you know, a nice sort of, uh, a, you know, multi-value field where we can select and enable the different languages for the region. And then there's a country module, which gave us a very, very, very long list of checkboxes for countries, and you just have to go in one by one and check, 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 check. So, um, we combine that then with a, just a glue module to strip out the, you, you saw in our languages, and you can see there actually, it's English EMEA and English North America and stuff. When you're so, showing that to the client or to the user on the site, you don't want to show them the region in the, the language name. So the region was there in the language name for the editors, but for the user, we just cut it out. And we had um, two drop downs at the top of the page, one for region. Actually, can I I'll briefly go there just to make it easier? Where's my mouse? Oh, there it is. So, um, you have your region drop down and language drop down that's enabled. So, North America just has English and Spanish. And if I go to Europe, then it reloads the page. And there's only three enabled here. I'm not quite sure what happened. Oh, I'm in Latin America. Um, so uh, where was I going with that? So that was one. It's for, for desktop, this is how it works. So when you choose your region, it will submit the form 
printer out the new language and return you know, the site in the, the localized local language and then update the language dropdown. But it will also then, if you're on mobile, that isn't necessarily a, a great user experience to click the thing and wanting to go to change the other dropdown. Um, so we have a different workflow for that with a, an actual submit button. Find my mouse again. So some useful information, and this is really where uh, I touch on all the pain points that we had. So in Drupal 8, uh, the new default caching, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's fast chaining, I think. Um, but basically, your configuration, all your configuration, which is your the, the configuration the structure of your content types and your configuration screens and how you can configure this and that, all of that is stored in, is cached to make the site faster when you're loading it. So it's not hitting the file system or the database every time. The default APCU limits on the hosting company that we were using, which is a well-known um, well Drupal hosting company, was set quite low. Um, and the reason, that was fine if you just had one language. But the thing is, when you have a multilingual site, say you have two, you're translating from English and German, say, you would now have doubled the amount of configuration. And if you then add on French, you've got three times the amount of configuration. You add in 13 languages, you've got a hell of a lot of configuration. The stored in cache, and we hit the limits, and the site was getting slower and slower and slower until eventually it would just crapped out and start giving us errors. But at least once we had errors, we kind of knew what was wrong. Um, so we switched to a thing called Memcache backend, which unfortunately doesn't support PHP 7, so we've, I think we've switched back to a database um, so we can use PHP 7. Then, as I mentioned earlier, paragraphs, get, your, get it out. Figure it out right first, whether you're using translation or localization, because if you get it wrong and you have to switch later on, you're going to lose your tr translations. They're still being the database, but the users won't see them, and it's, it takes a lot of messing around in the database and in the code to try and rebuild the links afterwards. So have the conversation with your client and ask them particularly about, well, what if the translation is not available in that language? on a landing page and those sort of things where you might use paragraphs more. But this is, that, that is really where it's going to matter. Google Translate. So we had, we, had a, we had the client entering all the translations. We weren't going to do that for the hundreds of pages that they had and the 13 languages. And a lot of it was copy and paste because for launch, English North America was actually the same as English Europe. Um, but, oh, and I missed on this point earlier. Um, when you configure your language negotiation, um, can I go back to it? It's right back at the start. <laughs> oh, this one. At the bottom, um, there's content language detection, and the top is interface text language detection. And by default, the, the first one is only checked, but you can check that box. Uh, checkbox at the bottom, which allows you to have a different language for your content and a different language for what you see as an editor. However, it didn't work for us, and there is a patch which stopped working for us. It worked for a while, but then it broke media somehow. Um, so we we're not using it, and we weren't using it at the time because the patch wasn't ready. Uh, but so that meant that our editors had to, sorry, I have to slip on again. Our editors were entering Russian with the form being in Russian and so on. So um, one of them decided that oh, it's just turn on Google Translate and that will get around the problem for me. What happened and what really surprised me was Google Translate decided to translate the content in the fields. Not all of them, just some of them depending on how fast it loaded or did it. But it would actually translate the content in the fields itself. And so they would go to us, because we had this issue with paragraphs and we had to switch from translation to localization, we lost all the English, or we've lost all our translation, it's reverting to English. So she did it for Google Translate, she turned on Google Translate, and then it was like, we're reverting to English again, randomly, but mainly only for Russian. Um, turns out, I, I couldn't, 
figure it out. So I did a screen share with her, and I saw that she doodle translate turned on. It was just Chrome trying to be helpful. Um, Would you like to translate this page? And she clicked yes. And that's what caused that issue. <laughs> Caching and redirects was also an issue. Uh, so if you so if you go to the naked domain without the slash en, and this is how we've set it up that you need to go to slash en for the default language as well. Like it, it doesn't just return the default language for that. Uh, thing. Anyway, it it needs to do it detects what language doing the language negotiation, and then it should redirect you to the correct thing without the user actually ever seeing it. But what was happening was that the redirect uh, was being cached, so. I would come along in English North America, I would get redirected to that language, and then somebody else would come along from France and they would see English North America. Because the redirect from the homepage to the other language was cached. Now we got around it, I think, by installing a patch. And part of the patch uh, was also to change the type of redirect. So there was a version of the patch and it was still not fully working right. So we patched it again uh, to change it from a permanent redirect to a temporary redirect. And the reason for that was Varnish uh, was caching or storing the permanent redirects for 15 minutes, even though the Drupal configuration was set, don't cache these sorts of redirects at all. The Varnish uh, set up on the server for the hosting company was ignoring the Drupal settings and what Drupal was saying and was actually caching it for 15 minutes. And there was no way we could change that. The hosting company couldn't do that for us because it would affect more than just us. So uh, we figured, well, actually, we should be using a temporary redirect anyway, not a permanent one. The other thing to watch out for if building a multilingual site is your SEO. So they're my favorite XML sitemap module for Drupal 7. It doesn't actually support multilingual, at least not in Drupal 8. There's another one called Simple Sitemap. So there are uh, language, or there's certain tags that you need to have in your XML sitemap to say, well, there's an alternative language um, for this site, and here are the other versions of it in other languages. Similarly, you should have a link tag at the top of your HTML in the head with the href line, um, and there's a module for that as well. Uh, which I'll give the link to later. So it just says here are the alternative language versions. And particularly when you're doing localized content in regions where it is kind of the same, it helps uh, minimize the duplicate content SEO penalty that you might otherwise get. And then design. Watch out for design if you're doing multiple language languages. So um, the most obvious cases are, say you have English, German, and Russian, or no, English, German, and Chinese. So you design your site, the designer is looking in English, everything's beautiful, you put in German text, suddenly your boxes have words that are this long, and it's overflowing, and you need to account at the design stage how you're going to handle really long words that you, how do you hyphenate it? How do you figure where to put that correct hyphen if you're doing that, or, yeah. So, and then Chinese is the opposite. The long words become really short. And those are only three characters or four characters long. So your design just has to be flexible enough to handle all of that. So here are some of the modules you might want to consider. So the href line just adds in the links to the top of the page. It's very simple. Simple XML sitemap supports the, the, the language stuff in, in that pretty well. We use the language switcher dropdown because with 13 languages or even when you cut it down to, the, to just your region, there is five or six, I think it's the most in one. You, you don't want the links, which is the standard out of the box with Drupal core. Um, if you're doing localization, then you need the IP language negotiation stuff. Probably with a patch that's on the list on the next page. And then there's a really nice module called translation management tool. And um, so if you're, we're not using it, but uh, if, well, we are using the module, but we're not using it for its main purpose, I think, which is to allow you to hook up with external translation companies um, who provide integration, and you can submit content to be translated to them. They translate it, and then they submit it back. And I don't mean an automatic translation like Google Translate, though I think it can do that, but actual you know, manual translators would use their own system and then submit, and it would end up in a draft or ready for review on your site. But the reason, even though we're not using that feature, the reason that we install it 
is, and when you do install it, you get a, you get a translation drop down, and your jobs are the things you can send to external translators. You also get this nice sources page. So here you have your list of nodes, or yeah, well, I'm, it's content, so nodes in this case, and the list of languages. Um, now, probably need to go on to the next page, because this is just a dev site. So you get a little green tick box if it's been translated into that language, and you get an X if it hasn't. And there's a little legend at the bottom, like there's needs review and in progress and other stuff. But, and it's if the translation is outdated, so if the source has been edited and modified, you can configure it to mark it, the, all, all the other translations as needing updating. So it's just, it's just nice when you're dealing with this number of languages and this number of pages, it's a very useful report. Um, so the patches that we used, uh, so the first one was to fix the content versus interface language negotiation. We couldn't quite get, it worked for a while and then uh, some update happened and well, it, it just, it worked but it, it didn't work with the media or image uploads stopped working or something. Um, I, I can't quite remember. And then the second one is for the preventing it to cache the redirect to the correct language. Uh, there is the patch, which is still in the needs work uh, thing for paragraphs to support localization. It has worked successfully for us for six months now. Uh, it is missing tests. Uh, if you want to contribute on Code Sprint Day, that's a good use of your time. Um, and then we also had issues with the entity browser, which we added on later on. Um, it, it couldn't pick up the, lang the media items we were referencing in the, in the correct language, so the alt text was in English, even though it should have been in French. But there's a patch, and that works perfectly. Um, there's great documentation, that link. And all the slides will be going up online afterwards, so um, you don't have to jot all these down. And yep, I'm just going to wrap up, but basically there is a code sprint. Well, no, not just a code sprint, contribu contribution sprint. So you don't have to be a coder, you can be a designer or write documentation or just help manage people and get them working on something together. So please do come along on Friday and please rate the session. Um, and questions. For the questions, if you could use the microphone in the middle of the room. When you were trans when you were translating the view, you were in the views UI. To do yeah. that. But as long as the view the, the strings have been triggered somewhere, you can get to them as well through the translation UI where you just fill in the word and you get the list of all occurrences of the word. And that, that allows you to not have to navigate and click open everything. Does that work for the menu items too? It should. And Normally the, okay. it, it, it shows we were... everything that's translatable that's, that's actually handled as using, using string translation. Okay, this, we're also translating the links, so the, the path bit would also, I'm not sure. would also translate. Okay, it's good to know though. So I have a question about all the paragraphs you could extend for your uh, options. Did you use some tools to extend it all in all, or you really clicked everything to open the paragraph to extend them? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So um, you have like the, the menus to extend them. You click it and you extend the menu. Yep. And when you click on paragraphs, yes. So it's did just you like manual or, or you used some tool to extend it automatically everything? No, it was it's just as edge of the box. So you just click on the paragraph and then things appear. It's quite some job. <laughs> Hello, uh, thanks for the presentation. I had two questions regarding this translation mechanism. The first one is for the translation of files because in Drupal 7 you couldn't really translate file entities. You could translate the title and different other, other fields that were attached to the file, but you couldn't say that my PDF A was the translation of PDF B. And is this now addressed or going to be addressed somewhere in this Drupal 8 track? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Like we, we didn't deal with PDFs in this site. It was images and they didn't have text in the images. So like files are entities in, in Drupal 8, so it should work and you should be able to translate the f image, like image or file, you should be able to 
say that for this translation, you can upload a different thing to replace it. So I think it should work, but uh, don't hold me to that. <laughs> it's not okay, something I've tried. You. And then my second question is, um, okay, we have fieldable entities which are translatable by field. And what about the, tra the, um, the publication workflow? Is, is now possible to, to, try to have a publication workflow per language, or is it always for the entire node? We didn't do it on this site, uh, but we have done another one since on a simpler site, and it was, you were able to, to lock it down. I think we were using the workflow module rather than workbench, uh -huh. but I can find out for you if you want. Um, I wasn't involved in that one, but it was possible for them to have, to have a certain language was in draft while the other ones were published. Yeah, and not to revert all languages at once, for example. Yeah, I don't think you had to do okay. that, but I can check that for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, how do you handle uh, and manage uh, the interface translations? Uh, do you are using uh, Podix to uh, export uh, languages and create uh, PO files? So when you say, th which translations are you talking about? The the, the system strings or? System strings, yes. The system strings are not configuration, they're stored in the database. Um, you can export them as a .po file and upload them to localize.drupal.org if you want to contribute them back. Uh, but, you, yeah. You, you don't have any experience with Podix. With Pod Podix. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, the, the, the POTX or whatever. POTX, yes. Yeah, so like, you can download those from localize.drupal.org, but we're not storing them because we, we don't want to store them. Um, or maybe we are, maybe they're in it. But uh, they're lo we, we don't keep them up to date because once we've got the, the key strings that we want to translate it, we don't really go back. We contribute back if we can, if they're for a contributed module or core. Um, but we don't maintain the PO files. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> um, with uh, XML sitemap, after you generate all the versions for other language, do you actually submit uh, to the like Google? For yeah. So um, the simple XML sitemap or simple sitemap, whichever it's called, it doesn't do the auto submit. So XML sitemap was nice in that you could re resubmit your content every day. I don't think it does that. But so you can manually log into Google Webmaster Tools or Bing Tools and give them the URL and they'll crawl it every so often. And, and you just have to do it once because it links to the other ones so you don't have to do it for every language. And does it help in terms of uh, localization if you submit into Google uh, Webmaster? It in doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, I think it helps because it knows that there's more versions of the same page in different languages and there's just more things to crawl. Um, this, I'm not quite sure what way XML sitemap does it, which is, it, there, there is a risk of, of Jupyter content penalty. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it helps. It's, like, it's not going to hurt, so. Thanks, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, maybe you don't use the web form module but that has a very handy uh, interface for translation where you can translate in the graphic user interface, uh, translate uh, the strings in YAML code. But yeah. have you come across similar interface for other translation? No. And I have seen that one for Webform, but no, I haven't seen it in anything else. Thank you. Um, how do you translate view paths? How do I translate, sorry, what? View paths. Uh, view paths, so in that views configuration or translation, if you click far enough in and you find where you set the paths. No, no, it isn't. Oh, okay, you're right. The other thing you can do is set up an alias. So you can set up an alias for your language and just say slash news is slash nuoct in Irish and you just say for Irish version, redirect to this URL, or, or set up an alias. Okay. It works. Okay. okay, well, if there's no other questions, we'll leave it there. Thank you.
Oh, if you want to come to Drupal Camp Dublin, that's in, at the end of October, 20th and 21st. <laughs> hey, did I answer your question?